You welcome to the Desert United Methodist Church. I'm Dave, one of the pastors here. I'm really glad to see you. I see a bunch of faces I don't know. I see some people that came in that are members, have crazy haircuts that I haven't seen. Hey, it's good to see you, Earl. You gotta tell me when you get a haircut and you change your face like that. It's just it's different. Anyways, I if you're a guest, we're really glad you were here. If you're a member, if you're a long-term friend of Dove, we're really glad that you're here. Today, this particular service today, this is our third worship service of the day, this is a special one. This is our confirmation service for our confirmands of 2022, and we are so proud of them. Let's give a pre-warm-up hand. Oh my gosh, you guys. At the end of service, we will offer a, a liturgy. There will be a baptism of three of our confirmands. It's, it's going to be a blessing. We're going to run a little over today. I hope that's all right. Uh, but this is a big enough blessing that I hope uh, you, you find it worth your time. Uh, as you came in, I hope you grabbed one of our bulletins. It has our order of worship so you know how things are uh, unrolling today, unraveling as we worship together. It also has a number of invitations. One of the things we try to do here at Dove is we try to create as wide of a spectrum of opportunities for people in different places in life to connect with either doing good or working on themselves or just being with other people who are non-toxic. That's kind of what we're about, is, is building the community. So I hope you see something in our bulletin that you like. 
Uh, one of the things that may have fallen out is this little guy, this little pamphlet. We're part of the United Methodist denomination. And as a part of that, there are six Sundays a year that the, the larger denomination asks us to put a request out. This Sunday, it's uh, for our Native American Ministry Sunday, our, our ministry to our indigenous neighbors. Uh, this is a scholarship program that helps students in those communities who want to pursue paths of ministry. I know uh, firsthand people whose lives have changed through the generosity of this scholarship. So if that's something that you uh, want to pursue, I do encourage you to learn more information about it and consider giving. I also want to let you know, this past Friday night and this past Saturday night, we had a concert here. This whole stage was transformed. By the way, thank you to our trustees, especially Keith Burt and our altar arts teams that stayed over extra and like redid this so we had worship up here, our worship settings up here. They did it last night, really late at night after the second concert. But there was a bell choir concert here. But it was more than bell choir. There were different instruments and different uh, groupings of music. And there was imagery and there was written word. It was this multimedia experience that was about providing hope. The idea was that this world is a little bit darker than maybe we'd like it to be. It's a little bit... <sighs> It's a little bit more broken than we hoped it would be. The shadows creep in, and we want there to be light. That's the metaphor in the Bible, right? A candle, a city on a hill, a light. This idea was this concert would bring a little light, maybe to your life, but maybe to another organization. There's, a group, there's, a, there's an organization two miles south of us called Thrive Arizona. It's a foster care organization. They help make sure kids don't get put into foster care, and they help the young adults who are aging out of the foster care program with safe housing and education for a career. We said that kind of place instills hope. We want to invest in that. So we took all of the ticket sales from Friday night show and Saturday night show. We're giving it all to them. And the total for two nights was $4,260. My gratitude to you, because you were generous with, with your finances and supporting that concert in coming. You were generous with your time, but you're just generous overall. And you've been looking, as a church, we've been looking for those places we can pour ourselves into. And I'm just really grateful for you guys. So thank you as we begin this relationship with Thrive with this kind of generosity. We come into worship today. This is an Easter season. This is a season we still talk about new life and renewal and new hope and resurrection. Last week, we talked about a coward who could no longer keep his mouth shut. We talked about the Apostle Peter. This week, we take it a step further. An enemy of Christianity is turned into one of the greatest writers of the Christian church. It's going to be a message about change. I think we can all learn something from it. Let's be blessed. Mary, come on up and start us with worship. Come, let us praise the Lord. Let us worship our risen Savior, for death has given away to life. Despair has been overwhelmed by hope. Grief, Grief has, has been, been replaced, replaced by joy, joy and darkness, darkness dispelled, dispelled by light. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Please join me in prayer. Oh, you may please sit down. <laughs> According to Greg. <laughs> this is awkward, this microphone thing. <laughs> please join me in prayer. Oh my God, teach my heart where and how to seek you and where and how to find you. Though I have never seen you, you are my God and master of my life. You have made me and remade me, and you have bestowed on me all the good things I possess. But you are still the unknown, for I have not yet reached that for which I was fully made. Teach me to seek you, for I cannot seek unless you teach me or find you unless you reveal yourself to me. Let me seek you in my desiring. Let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you in my loving, and let me love you in my finding. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
join me in singing. As we pray together uh, today, I'm going to ask you to continue two prayers throughout the day, if you would. The first is for our compromands who are here. Um, I ask the other two worship uh, gatherings to do the same, just to pray blessing over them today, as this is, this is important. This is a statement about who they say they are, and so we want to honor that, and um, I think a prayer blessing throughout the day would be good for them. The other prayer request I will ask is for a family, um, Sarah Meyer's family. Sarah is uh, a member of our congregation who transitioned from this life to the next on Friday evening after a long battle with cancer. And moments like this where you like celebrate new life in the church and you're also saying farewell, it's like that paradox and it, you never know really how to hold that tension, but we're there. My request then is that you would pray for all of us. Um, Sarah's family, for those of us here who grieve, who lost a friend, but also that we are inspired, that we, we live in between the moments of life and death and we are given all of these opportunities and choices in every encounter that we have with folks. Um, and I just, I don't want us to take them for granted. So perhaps we can pray about that today. Let's pray together. Faithful, generous, patient God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gifts of today. We thank you for the license that you give us to live our life on our terms. We are grateful for that free will. We pray together as a church because we believe. We believe that our voices together mean something to you. We believe that our repeating sometimes the same prayers over and over, they mean something to you. And so we keep coming back and we refuse to quit because you have said you're the God that acts, so we're going to hold you to that. We pray this morning for our compromands, for the 11 who are here today, for the four more that will receive this blessing in June. We are so proud of them. These are women and men who are just exceptional. Their intelligence, their passion, their, their ability to be humans is, is a gift in this world, Lord, that we can all learn from. Help us to be authentic like them. They can lead us in that. Help us to, to ask difficult questions. Help us as the established church to give them the freedom to express their faith on their terms in their context. And may the church never be a hindrance to how younger generations worship and connect to you. One of the great church fathers said that the church must always be reforming. May this be a confirmation class that pushes your, for your church to the next edge, that meets new people in mercy and justice and compassion, 
And may those who are joining the church today take part in that blessing that is your story. We pray for Sarah Meyer's family. We pray that in this season of grief, that they can recall the gifts and the blessings of her life. We pray that as they grieve, that they would see the pinpoints of light through the nighttime that shined in her life and that gave her daughters and her grandchildren hope. We pray those of, those of us here who are missing her already would be reminded that this is not the final stage and that there is something beyond this life that you have planned. We will walk faithfully until that time is ours. Thank you, God, for hearing these prayers. Thank you, God, for being present in our life even now. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. I don't know if I've told this story or not, but I was raised in an evangelical fundamentalist church here in Arizona. And I was raised from, I mean, from the time I came out of my mother's womb in November of 1978 until I left that church, I was raised to be a pastor. They told me, you're going you're gonna to preach the word. You're going to be a tent revivalist like your grandfather. You're going to do this and this and that. And my experience in religion was all wrapped around that, that experience, that this is who you're going to be. My Bible class experiences and my mission trip experiences and my service project experiences, all of that was all formed around this idea that this church had, Dave's going to be a pastor. They regret that now, I am sure. <laughs> but I say that to give you this context. This person that we're going to read about in Acts chapter 9, the position that they achieved, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, as we know him as we enter into this story, was raised from the jump to be a religious leader. He had, he had, all, he had the pedigree, he had all the certificates, he had all the education, he had just proven himself. One of the great teachers, we actually came across him last week, Gamaliel. He was one of Gamaliel's students. He was the best of the best of the best. He wasn't an atheist. He didn't worship Baal. He didn't worship Asherah. He didn't worship any of the other pagan gods of the region. He worshipped Yahweh. Saul worshipped the same God that you worship. And when he was Saul, he would have killed you. Not, not even thinking twice, sure of himself that he was doing God's holy work. We come to this story in Acts 9 when Saul changes life. And it's hard to, to put our minds in that perspective when we think about how dedicated, how his whole life, oh my goodness, Paul flips the switch. And it's changed forever. This is like one of the most dramatic stories in the New Testament because Paul isn't just a guy who becomes a Christian. Saul, who eventually becomes Paul, the Saul who hated Christians and Christianity, hated the way, the name of the movement for early Christianity. Paul becomes a major voice in every existing denomination of Christianity that is here today on earth. Paul has a finger in every theology of every type of church. Baptist, Lutheran, Catholic, Christian church, Methodist. We can go further. Paul's influence is really, I don't know that we can really capsulate it in one idea. But this was a man who started on a, what he believed was a righteous path toward God. 
And yet he had an encounter with God, and God said to him, your eyesight is too small. Let me blind you until you can reorient yourself. We don't have time to do the whole story. I wish we did. We just don't. That's not how our worship is set up. The lectionary gives us six verses, but if you want to read this story, you need to start in Acts 7. Read all of Acts 7 up to chapter 8, verse 3. Then you can go to Acts 9, where we're going to start. But I want you to read, when you get home, 1 through 20. We're only going to do 1 through 6 today. But this is an important story. Let's start here in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged to the way, that's the name of early Jesus followers, right? Whether women, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem during the journey. As he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came the reply. Now, get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. of us who've walked around in Christianity for any amount of time understand that while we don't have the full kind of encapsulating understanding of God, there are, there are bits and angles to God that we do. There are some pieces that we have seen, whether it's through our study of the Bible, or whether it's through our, our, our thought processes or our experience or even tradition in the church, there are places we can see some attributes of God. And I think one of the major attributes that we can see with God is change. God is a change agent, a tremendous change agent. God is a part of changes. Change is at the heart of our theological identity, the idea that we put away the old self and something new is made, that we can get rid of the past and walk into a future without guilt or shame. These are all changes. They're changes from how the world even addresses us. While the world is waiting to cancel us, to shut us up, to pigeonhole us, to compartmentalize us, God is looking to free us, to change us. That's why Acts 9, I think, I hope, resonates a little bit. This idea that this opponent of God's movement is so profound that if God can change that person around, then surely 
little old me has a shot in God's kingdom. I hope that you see that because that's the low-hanging fruit of this text. Not that it, you have to be a, reli- a religious elite leader for God to do something like that in your, in your heart. No, this is about the disparity, the level of brokenness. And if someone can take someone who believes that they are so close to God and yet they are so breaking God's creation, and God can change that person, then surely God can do that with everyone else. But we might ask, what about this change? Isn't this, this, this is a Bible story change. This is vacation Bible school change. This is a neat Bible story that we hear about the past that gives us a little boost of serotonin in our brain. But does God really do that anymore? Does God change us that way anymore? And then that harrowing thought enters our head. If God still does work like that, could, could he do that to any of us that believe in him? Could, could we be wrong about something? Could we need to change our perspective? There's a writer by the name of David Lamott. He wrote a book a while back called World Changing 101. He challenges the ways that we, cha- that we, we view, that we often view change in our lives and its role in the world. He talks about hero narratives. That is, that we assume that things change only when someone extraordinary encounters a moment of crisis and does something dramatic. I mean, that sounds familiar. That sounds like the formula for most Bible stories, right? We're quick to assume that all of our experiences of great change in life or in faith, they have to happen like they did to Saul on the road to Damascus. A bright light beams down and blinds you and there's a voice from heaven that shakes your bones and you can't eat for three days afterwards because you're so shook by the experience. We think that's what it has to be. But nestled in this story is another story of change that I think is just, if not more compelling than Saul's. And it's the story of Ananias. Let me frame it like this. We live in Phoenix, and public transport's not great, so most of us are in cars half of the day, right? Yeah, we are. We're on the 101, or the 202, or the 51, or the 303. We're on, in cars. And if you're like me, you listen to stuff. You listen to music sometimes. You know, maybe an audiobook, maybe a podcast, maybe silence. But I listen to a lot of music. And occasionally... There, a song will come on my Spotify playlist or an album I'm listening to, and it is just an absolute banger. And I have to turn the volume up. And I have to let the windows, all the windows down. Whether or not the air conditioning is on full blast, the windows are coming down. And I'm tapping on my wheel. And I'm hitting the side of the car. People outside are now noticing my hand with a rhythm. And then, and then the voice comes out. Life is a highway. I want to ride. I'm not going to sing. I, you just start singing. There's some songs that just make you sing. You know I'm right. Don't sit there quiet like pastor's weird. There are songs that you can't help but sing. They move your very soul. And that's totally cool. But get this. Sometimes in the middle of those songs, there, you know, there's a known rhythm. It's verse, chorus, verse, chorus. But occasionally in the song, something will happen. Somebody will pop in something different. There'll be a, a song and a verse that we know, but there might be a key change. You ever heard a key change before in a song? Of course you have. You're a church. You've heard a key change. And a key change isn't a rewriting of the song. It's a reframing of the things we've already experienced in, in a different class of notes, in a different way of hearing it. No, when the song changes, the song I love changes, I don't flip to the next track. I let the key change change the song. And I continue to hear the song. And I continue to enjoy it, but now from a little bit different perspective, a different angle. Change isn't always about picking a completely different song. Sometimes change is about modulation. Something that adds interest and dimension to a rich melody and to a beautiful pattern that's already there. 
And if I can use that metaphor of the key change, that's what I want to talk about. And so that's how I want to put Ananias in your mind, rather. And we don't know much about this guy, before or after. But we, we assume that he's a status quo new Christian. Maybe only having been a Jesus follower for a few months. He's a faithful follower, though. He lives in Damascus. And what we know is that he says yes to God. As a matter of fact, he says yes to God sometimes without hearing the details. Which is one way to go about it. God says, you're going to go across town. You're going to go to this place called Straight Street. There's a guy named Judas. He has a house there. In that house is a fellow who is blind. He has encountered the living God in Jesus Christ. I want you to go there. I want you to heal him. I want you to reconcile with him. I want you to make him whole. Ananias says, absolutely, let's go. God says, it's Saul. Ananias says, whoa. All, all wise creator of heaven and the universe. Do you know what you just said? Do you know who you just asked me to go and, and, and reconcile with? This is Saul. This isn't just like Nicodemus, just a guy who's kind of, you know, behind the curtains one way and in front of the curtains the other. This isn't just like Peter who was like talking big and then running away. This is a man who claims God to know you. And he's killing us in your name, God. So let's just be clear. You want me? to go to him and strengthen him. Okay. God doesn't blink in this questioning from Ananias. He assures Ananias that God knows what God is doing. That God is in charge and will take care of everything that needs to be taken care of in regards to Saul. But God has called you, Ananias, to go and do this act of compassion. God knows what's going to happen. God has some kind of forethought that's going to play out. Saul will be saved. Saul will become Paul. And Saul, who becomes Paul, will become a person and a name in the church that will affect the church throughout its earthly existence. And Ananias was at a moment where he could be faithful to God and go to this enemy and be compassionate. He had no idea idea of the grand plan. It shouldn't be surprising to Ananias, perhaps, or even us, that God picked somebody imperfect to be the messenger. That's, That's the MO of God. That's the status quo. God picks oftentimes the rejects, the weirdos, the outsiders. But Paul, but Saul rather, he's not Paul yet, but Saul. Saul's not even passively a problem. He is an active, avid, rabid attacker of Christians. You have to understand the difficulty it is for Ananias to imagine and much less support that this is what needs to happen. Some understandable doubt is to be expected. After all, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? I mean, it gets said. Or, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Like, there's a, there's a level of caution that we almost anticipate someone like Ananias should have, right? This, though, in the most critical of ways, is the experience of Ananias. This risk versus the call. To be clear, God isn't asking Ananias to the kind or the level of reversal or conversion that it appears he's asking of Saul. But God is asking Ananias to change his tune. He's asking Ananias to experience a key change, to elevate his discipleship to a new level that may very well be a reach for him. God is asking Ananias to experience a tremendous life view change that widens his understanding of who is included in God's kingdom, of who God is calling to lead, and what it literally looks like to follow Jesus. David Lamott, the author, I'll return to him, he writes this, it is not naive to think that you can change the world. 
In fact, it is naive to think that you could possibly be in this world and not change it. Everything you do changes the world whether you like it or not. So the questions we must ask ourselves are, which changes will we make and how will we go about making them? Well, cue the bridge and the key change because Ananias follows God's instructions. He enters the house on Straight Street and he completes the tasks on hand as he is asked, laying his hands on the one who by all accounts might kill him as soon as he regains his sight. Trusting the Holy Spirit will cover all the details that he doesn't have the answers for. It's an incredible recon reconciliation moment though as Ananias in that risky faithfulness goes and meets with Saul and heals the blindness and Ananias calls him a brother in faith. From that moment, Saul's message changes. His movement changes. Saul has a new song now. He goes into all Jerusalem and begins proclaiming Jesus as Lord. And of course, like I said earlier, Paul's story doesn't end there. There's not one church you've ever walked into that didn't have some aspect of Pauline theology in it. For Ananias, change came because of God's vision and his own willingness to listen. Even when it seemed counterintuitive, he was willing to shift. Even like those microscopic shifts, those tiny ones. And he opened himself to the possibility that God had a bigger perspective than he did. He trusted in God's guidance and was willing to follow and see where it would go. I love that for the text today. It reminds us that we don't have to rewrite songs or invent totally new melodies in order to be a part of what God is doing. Perhaps we are simply called to take the good news that we know and put it through a key change. I think that's what many of our ministries here at Dove are. They are our theological imperatives, those things we think about God and the way God interacts in the world. And we try to find the most relatable, practical, meaningful way to express that. That's why we have partnerships with organizations like Family Promise, who helps families who are encountering, who are about to encounter homelessness for the first time. That's why we are partnering with Thrive Arizona, because we think if we can stop families uh, we think we can stop families from being separated through foster care, then we should. And if we can help the young adults who are aging out on the other side, that just makes real practical sense too. We're going through a key change here, and it's good. It's less about those grandiose moments and the sweeping changes, and it's instead about, and it's instead about finding the work that is ours to do next. To be willing, as Ananias was, to discover God's vision and to have the courage to say that we will try to be disciples in the ways that are familiar and in the ways that might just be surprising. And that way, with the song that God has given us as individuals and as a community of faith, we can take on new life to carry us into the future. And I'm looking forward to it with you all. Amen.
I didn't have confirmation as a kid because of the church I grew up in. I only experienced confirmation for the first time 10 years ago or so, the first time that I taught it. I don't even know I taught it really well back then, but I know this. I know that the, the act, the process of confirmation, of the confirmands coming together, it was more than just the information. It was more than just the disbursement of God is this in your life, and now you have to regurgitate that. Confirmation was about seeing the community and seeing where people fit in, where I fit in, where you fit in. I don't know exactly what your confirmation experience might have been. This one this year was unique. It was condensed into 10 weeks. We didn't have a retreat. We didn't have a lot of quote-unquote field trips. The service projects were dispersed throughout the life of the church. We did all these things as part COVID precautions as we began and part just trying to meet the needs in the context of a busy world where we had 15 students in our confirmation class who came, almost every one of them as they could, for 10 weeks in a row. And look, there's no, there's no school credit for this. There's, this doesn't, I mean, it's not, you can try it, put it on your resume, I'm going to recommend you don't. Like, they did this because they wanted to be here. Sure, the parents might have nudged a little some Sundays. I'm, I, I'm not dumb, okay? But they came. And I have to tell you, the two hours every Sunday that I spent with every one of the students was a gift to me. It made me richer. It made me smarter. It made me sharper. And so I am I'm indebted to you. I said this to the other two services, but I wanted to save this for here. The fact that we have 11 confirmands this morning and three who will receive baptism is much, much less a statement about the quality of the confirmation process and much, much more a statement about who you have been as a church for the past decade and a half of their life. They came into confirmation with knowledge. They came into confirmation with spiritual discernment. That doesn't happen through confirmation class. It happens because they were a part of a church that continued to see them and validate them, to give them space at their table, and to welcome their voice. My hope is that after today, that will only continue. I am grateful to all of you. Thank you. You've all been a part of this confirmation process. I'm going to invite all 11 of our confirmants to go ahead and come up forward. Come forward here, and I'm going to have you stand and face. One of you has to be the first to stand up, I know. I'm going to have you stand up here, if you would. Make me a line, real briefly. Let's give them a hand while they come up. people that I didn't see at the beginning of worship, they're all here now. That's great. I'm glad you guys made it. It's good to see you. If I didn't get to see you earlier, hi, it's good to see you. Um, this is our, this is, this is our, a little over two-thirds of our confirmation class. The other four will be confirmed in June um, when, they, when they can be all here together. So we're going to begin this. I'm going to invite the three of you who are being baptized to come over here with me right now, and we'll start with this. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church, we are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, and we are given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. And through confirmation, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledging that God, what God is done, doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. We're blessed to baptize three candidates today and confirm 11. Those coming forward uh, for baptism today, you see here with me now, Coleman Burkhart, Xavier Saucedo, and Mita Watt. The Lord be with you all. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. 
In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your Holy Spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare Christ's work to, to the nations, his glory among all people. Most holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away sin and to clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. We'll now receive you each to be baptized. I'm going to ask you a brief question just about receiving Jesus. You tell me yes or no. Hopefully yes. And I'll baptize you. Mita, I baptize you in the name of Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holman, you receive Jesus Christ as your rabbi and savior. Holman, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Xavier, you receive Jesus as your rabbi and savior. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and This is a consecration, consecrated oil. Holy Spirit, we pray that with this oil that their baptism is sealed and they, they know that they are marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. The Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may each be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on back over. I'm so proud of these guys. I present for confirmation Tatum Bethke, Coleman Burkhart, Caitlin Capper, Luke Curliss, Joey Eager, Julie Eager, Owen Moody, Grayson Oswald, Eric Probarican, Xavier Sacedo, and Mita Watt. In, in June, we will confirm Taryn Getting, Grayson Getting, Cassidy Snyder, and Jacob White. The words are going to be on the screen. It'll say what you say after I read something, okay? okay. Compromands. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful to will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Will you, who are members of the church, support and encourage their Christian life? Do you, the congregation as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? 
Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include every single one of these persons before you now in your care? Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary, Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come in to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and ever, everlasting. Now, to all who are being confirmed, and all who have been baptized in this congregation, remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember that the Holy Spirit works within you. And having been born through water and the Spirit, you can live life as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. As members of this congregation, will you, confirmands, faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Everything The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish each of you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Let's welcome our new sisters and brothers in Christ. <laughs> Pastor Jean is here, and I asked Pastor Jean... Uh, you guys may not have met her very much, or at all, I don't know, but she's one of the pastors, and she's been praying for you guys, and the prayer ministry team has, and I asked her to write just a quick blessing prayer for you, so she's going to offer that now. I got a handheld. You good? All right. Let's pray. Holy and almighty God, this morning, Holy and Almighty God, this morning we are celebrating the baptism and confirmation of these young disciples. 
To that end, we seek your blessing upon those who have been newly baptized into the Christian faith, and upon those of us who, in witnessing their baptism, remember our own baptism. May each one of us live life remembering to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We seek your blessing on these young disciples who have been confirmed into the body of Christ, becoming members of this congregation of the United States. Pastor Gene, uh, this uh, it's a culmination of a lot of work that you guys put into this, and and I'm I'm deeply appreciative of that. This is your baptism certificate. This is yours. This is yours. See, they're not standing in alphabetical order. So I'm going to do this real quick, um, but also. Never mind. I got it. I got it. I got it. Caitlin. Caitlin Cap. By the way, Tatum Bethke. Everyone, this is Tatum. Say hi to Beth. Welcome, Tatum, to the church. This is Caitlin Capper. This is Coleman Burkhart. This is Mita Watt. Here's Luke. Luke Curlis. Joey. Joey Eager. Julia Eager. Owen Moody. Grayson Oswald. Eric. How did I? Did I? I butchered, I butchered it. It's okay, though. I still love you, man. It's okay. Here is your confirmation. Mita, back to you. You got two. And now, the really important thing, name tags. Luke, you get yours first because I hear it's a big deal. So, <laughs> Luke, Coleman, <laughs> you guys, Caitlin, I'm just going back and forth over here. Joey, here's yours. Caitlin, here's yours. Julia. If I don't do this now, it won't get done. So I'm doing it now. Tatum, Grayson, Eric, Xavier, and Mita. Please give my friends one more big hand. Show them you're proud of them, you love them. Now, uh, a real blessing. We get to celebrate communion with our with our new church members, and it's and it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm I'm thrilled. There's a lot of guests here, so let me just say this: here in the Methodist Church. Uh, there's no there's no requirement for participating in our Lord's Supper here. So if you want to participate, that's that's good. We want you to participate too. This morning we will have four stations. There'll be one, two, three, and four up here. The ushers will kind of help guide you. If you see a line starting to shrink and you're in that area, go ahead and form in that line. There's also a gluten-free station in the back, and I believe there are some hands-free cups if you're still preferring no contact. All right, let's begin this prayer. 
We gather around this table today, Almighty God, to give you thanks. You claim us as your people. Bathe us in forgiveness through baptism and draw us together into your church. You call us to be your royal priesthood, a holy people, and you give us this holy meal as food for our journey. Today, these confirmands professed their faith and your presence in their journey. Today, they claim your gracious love for themselves and seek to live into a deeper and mature faith. Give them your grace and peace. Now, we remember, we join together to remember and experience anew the presence of the risen Christ in our midst at this table. We give thanks for the gracious life of Christ, teaching and healing, challenging and loving, dying and rising. We remember the night in which he gathered his friends, he broke bread, he gave thanks for the bread, and then he gave it to them, saying, take this, and whenever you do, remember my ministry of word and deed and my love for you. And when the meal was over, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he passed it around, said, drink from this, all of you, and remember the promise that God made so many generations ago that is being fulfilled now in your midst. As we eat this bread and drink of this cup, pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that we may go forth to live as those claimed by you, your holy people, spreading holiness and wholeness into your world this day. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen. I'd like to invite those who are assisting to go ahead and come forward. Bread of heaven given to you. Hey, Bob. Bread of heaven given to you, brother. Amen. Bread of heaven given to you. Bread of heaven given to you. Proud of you. Bread of heaven given to you. Proud of you. Bread of heaven given to you. The bread of heaven given to you. Bread of heaven given to you, brother. Sharon, bread of heaven given to you. The bread of heaven given to you. Virginia, bread of heaven given to you.
Thanks for being a part of our worship today. Thank you for participating in our confirmation liturgy. To my confirmands, I again, I'm genuinely proud of you. And make your family do something nice for you today because you earned it. Like get dessert or something. Make them, they, you go them. They had to deal with me for 10 weeks. So, hey, as you go, this be blessed and look for the key change in your life because it may be there. Be well. See you next time.